You're about to hear the behind the scenes story of one of the biggest pop songs of all time. Mm -hmm. That part was there. And how one of the biggest bands of the past 30 years, Matchbox 20, almost crashed and burned. It is not a hit. It is not no. an instant hit by We sold 605 any. records or something, I think, on the first week. My guest, Rob Thomas, is really candid about the challenges he faced early in life. I was like a little kid who learned how to like make dime bags of weed by the time I was like 10 years old. How his career almost went in a totally different direction. I dropped out of high school and got my GED because I was gonna join the army. And the creative process behind his hits such as 3AM and Push, songs that turned him into a rock legend even though the critics didn't always see it that way. The first time I ever appeared in Rolling Stone, it was just a picture of me at Glastonbury looking really fat. It said, uh, the road to success leads to the deli tray. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Rob Thomas. Rob Thomas, thanks for, for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. Nice to talk to you. Um, to say, I mean, to say that you had like a Dickensian childhood is almost an understatement. You had a really difficult childhood. I know your parents split when you were like a baby. Um, do, did you have a relationship with your dad growing up at all? It was a weird, it still is, I think, a weird relationship that I have with my father in that he, uh, you know, him and my mother uh, separated. My mother was a force of a person, you know, she was a, yeah. a really big drinker and a big personality. And uh, she, that I think drove a wedge between me and my dad and his ability, yeah. you know, and to see me. And so uh, I, at the time, never really understood that. I just kind of thought he wasn't around a lot. Yeah. And I think my mom would kind of just let me, let me run with that narrative, even if she didn't feed it. Um, and so I just wound up... By the time, you know, my father and I got pretty estranged and we would see each other, I always liked him. He was always the nicest guy. Like I've kind of, I see good traits in me and I know that they, they come from my father. Um, but it's just that the way I grew up, my dad kind of came back into my life right when the band hmm. started to do well. Hmm. And then he was kind of around a lot. But by that point, I had gotten to an age where I had learned how to live without the need for yeah. parents. And yeah. I had, and my, and my family became my, you know, the people that I was on the road with. My manager was more of a father at that time, probably than my father. And so it was just a hard transition for me to be like, to be the kind of person that feels the need to pick up the phone on a holiday. And of the people I want to call, he was on that list. And so when those things happen, it just gets more and more estranged. And I keep yeah. thinking like cats in the cradle because my son and I are really, really close mm -hmm. and we talk all the time. But I tried to invite him out to Vancouver and he couldn't do it because he was too busy. And so I just hear like Harry Chapin playing in the back of my head. I'm like, <laughs> no. Yeah. My boy turned just like turned out just like me. Um, I mean, when you were, I mean, from, from the time you were, I mean, your entire childhood really um, was like a, a, it was a, a lot of financial instability, right? You were mm -hmm. moving around. You lived in South Carolina for some time. Um, both your mom and your grandmother, who you spent a lot of time with, um, had a lot of addiction issues. And tell me about just being a kid in that environment. Well, I mean, as a kid, it probably wasn't until middle school that I that I had anything to contrast it to. Yeah. It seemed pretty common. It seemed like a nor this is just the way the normal thing is. You know, my grandmother, who was another big personality, she was a big drinker in a really weird way in that she wouldn't drink for years. And then she would go on a really violent bender that lasted like two weeks. Hmm. Um, she owned a store. It was like a general store in South Carolina. And, and the house that we lived in was attached to the store. And it was a very meager uh, place. You know, like if there was a hole in the floor, it went straight to the ground. Um, and it was the major hub for all the tobacco farmers and all the people that kind of in the area. That's where they'd come for lunch. That's where they come for their Saturday nights. And she was she was allowed to sell boo or beer, but not liquor. So she would bootleg liquor out from under the stairs, and she would sell like uh, dime bags of weed to the to all the farmers and stuff as well. And it was it was all a friendly little business. But I was like a little kid who learned how to like make dime bags of weed by the time I was like ten years old. Um, None of it seemed out of the ordinary. It didn't seem strange because that's, that's what your environment was. Exactly. And then my mom, so my mother was always really, really smart and had a really great head for numbers. And she moved out to, she moved us to Columbia, South Carolina, and she lied about her age and had gotten a job because like she, she got married at 14 and then to get married again at 16, which 
at that time wasn't as uncommon in the South yeah. as, you know, as one would believe. So she lied about her age when she was like 19 or so and got a job in computer programming for a banking software company because it was a new field. They were still using like key cards for computers, right? And yeah. it was, and everybody who was doing it had to go to these seminars and learn about it because it didn't exist. And because she had a really good head of, and retaining numbers and things like that, she went and she shot, she excelled at it. And she, you know, that moved us up to a status where we could live in, in you know, a better shitty apartment in yeah. Columbia, South Carolina. And little by little, you know, we would we would kind of like live for a while. We would live however the guy she was dating was living. You know, like if she was dating a guy that had a little more money, then we had a little more money for a while. And if she was dating a biker, then we were all bikers for a while. Um, but she managed on her own to move us up to middle class, to a really nice middle class existence in Florida. We went to Sarasota for a very short period of time. And even then, like, I didn't know that we were, we didn't have money until like, I remember one kid at school, this girl, she says, oh, where do you live? And I was like, oh, I live in Shady Brook Apartments. And she goes, oh, you must be rich. And I, I spent most of the day thinking that, oh, that must be a nice apartment until it literally was that. I was like, oh no, she's making fun of me. I'm not rich. I live in it. I know that I live in a shitty apartment. I just didn't want to know it. Um, so we moved there. We moved to Orlando. And during Orlando, she moved her way up at Fiserv and Citicorp and became, you know, like the head of quality assurance. And we moved into a really, really nice place. And I think by then though, she took that opportunity to go back and relive some of the youth that she had taken away from her. And that left me a lot on my own, sometimes for days where she would, you know, she would go or, or I just wouldn't see her for days. Maybe she would leave early in the morning. She would come home late at night and we just wouldn't cross paths. What, what would she be doing? Um, sometimes just out making friends and partying, you know, meeting hmm. new men. Even uh, though she had this like stable job and stuff, she was. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It was kind of amazing. I think it, uh, it, it probably informed why I drink too much because I saw someone doing it and still being able to maintain functional. Yeah. Yeah. That's the functional and functional alcoholic comes from. Uh, so during that time, I think is where my rebellious streak started to come out of because I had a lot of this time to do it. And yeah. I, I, and I had this need to feel to rebel against her because I didn't know I needed structure at the time. And I didn't know, I thought that I was really appreciating the space that she gave me and all the kids in school thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Cause I didn't seem to have any rules, you know? Um, and I didn't have rules because whenever she would come in and crack down, her whole thing was just to kind of lock me down. So like I would be grounded and I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. So then I would leave. And, uh, and that just became longer and longer periods of time. Like from seven, 15 to 17, I would be gone for longer periods of time. I'd be gone for days, for weeks. Where, where and would then you go? I would start, well, for a while, I would be at friends' houses. I had a lot of friends that would, some friends would let me sleep in their car. Like my older friends would let me sleep in their car outside until their parents left and wow. then come in, take a shower at their house and get ready and still go to school. Um, I think every, every group of kids had that one parent who kind of took in the stray kids yeah. And had like three or four kids living in their, you know, in their garage or in their basement. And I had, you know, friends like that that would help me out. Um, for the longest time, I tried to maintain. I tried to keep everything going, tried to stay in school um, until I just couldn't. And then I think the first time I got suspended was the first time I decided to, to take off and hitchhike around the country. Or not, I'm sorry, not around the country, just around the Southeast, like maybe yeah. up and down to South Carolina and back, trying to get, check back in on my roots in South Carolina. And again, all of this felt pretty normal. Mm. at the time, you know, like what didn't feel normal is all these other kids that, you know, I was now in a nice middle-class school with nice middle-class kids yeah, and they had, they had school activities that they cared about and they had, they were really cared about their grades and they cared about, you know, where they were headed. And I, I had someone once tell me that when I was in like ninth grade biology or out no algebra that I had mentioned in school that I didn't need this because I was going to be a musician Hmm. And uh, someone said, well, you know, if you're going to be a musician without algebra, how do you count your money? And I said, well, I'll have an accountant and they'll take care of my money. I mean, it sounds like there was a lot of kind of um, instability in your in your childhood and, and into your teenage years. And and how did you tell me about music? I mean, I mean, obviously, everyone listens to music. Um, was 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 there music played at the house as your mom into particular types of music what what did you listen to growing up yeah, it's funny my mom did i mean like her stack of records influenced me a lot like i got a, had a drum set that my grandmother got me and i would have to play drums to her records so 
I was playing drums to like, you know, Grover Washington and give me the night. Uh, you know, a lot of like, uh, yep. that kind of like FM R and B pop R and B stuff that was mm -hmm. happening. Um, George Benson. So George Benson. I was yeah. gonna, that was going to yep. drive me insane. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't really a musical household. I think I really got turned on. But like, I remember my mother would have, they would have these parties and one of the, her friends or a group of her friends at her office had a band that would play these parties. And I would get up and I would play with these, with this band. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, you know, getting up and singing songs. And then, yeah. then I, like I had a job once at a BT bones, like a steakhouse in Florida and they'd have a band on the weekends. And it was a lot of bikers would go there. And I was a bus boy, but I would get up and sing like one or two songs on the weekend nights. And it got to the point where, you know, at a certain point in the night, these bikers would start going, singing, bus boy, singing, mm. bus boy. And I would mm. come running out from the back of the kitchen, you know, and come up and sing like, I think Walking on a Thin Line by Huey Lewis uh, was one of them. Um, I just had that bug. Yeah. And I was in ninth grade, uh, 1987, uh, Lake Brantley High School. And I had a group of seniors who became my friends and they were just about to graduate and go on to Berkeley College of Music, two hmm. of them. Wow. And they wanted to start a band. I started singing because I had a crush on this girl that was in chorus class. And so to try and get closer to her, I tried out for Guys and Dolls hmm. for the school musical. Right. Now, I didn't understand anything about musical theater. So I was like one of the first, to I was the first to audition and I came in and I just sang the song. I kind of stood there and I was like, I got the horse right here. His name is Paul Revere. And there's a guy that says if the... And, uh, and I was like, okay, I felt pretty good about that. And yeah. then I watched everybody after me, right? And everybody after me was, I got the horse right here. His name is Paul Revere. And I was like, oh, it's musical theater. I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. Um, but the, Mr. Deuce was the, uh, the choral director. And he said he thought he liked the tone of my voice. And he thought, mm. if, I, you know, if I wanted to, then I should join chorus. And so I joined chorus, which I only lasted a semester because it was all just a bunch of, you know, like Latin chants or something. And it yeah. wasn't for me. <laughs> uh, but he did let me skip classes every now and then and hide in one of the rooms to, to play piano. And, and that was like helping me learn how to play piano. And, uh, and, and did you, I mean, did you take piano seriously? I don't think I took anything seriously. The yeah. thing was, I didn't take it seriously, but at the same time, I spent 18 hours a day doing it. Yeah. Because it was it, like it, it thrilled me to do, you know. So in a way, I was building a work ethic towards music, but I didn't really think of it that way, and I didn't look at it that way. To me, I was trying to find ways to fuck off, and for me, yeah. fucking off was learning to play the piano and learning how to right. sing and learning to do these things. Because who? There's no way that was going to become a career, right? And so, <clears throat> I would have my friend that um, my mom at one point would let the band rehearse at our home at a certain time in the afternoon. And so- Is the band whenever, that, with, with the friends who were going to, to Berkeley College? Yes. So we were, I think at the time, we were a band called Fair Warning. Mm -hmm. we had, and you, we were, and Fair, you were the singer. I was a singer, yeah. yeah. And it was mostly, we were just doing 80s covers for the most yep. part. Um, and there was a guy named Kays Alatrakshi who was writing the originals. Like he would go to school, he would go to history class and learn about the Waltham system. And then we'd come back and write a song called The Waltham System. Uh, he was always like, he was, he's introduced me to all this like Depeche Mode and all these really great alternative bands. And, and th that was the kind of music he wanted mm -hmm. to write. Um, then the, when they went to Berkeley, it kind of stopped. I just, without music, I was kind of back to, I don't know, just general buffoonery. And I was getting in, getting, yeah, getting in trouble. Yeah. I was a kid sneaking out late, kind of getting arrested. Just a lot of, uh, I put probably a cry for attention, my therapist would say now. Um, just like my career. <laughs> um, but uh, when they came back, they brought back some other guys from Berkeley and they, had, they were a bunch of guys who had, I have to stress, had never been to the, a real beach. All these, these guys from, from Jersey, but they started a surf rock band called Tidal Wave. And uh, we would do covers like Wooly Bully you yeah. know, and, and like, like really amped up 50s songs like Louie Louie and Wooly Bully. And then they had originals like Me and My Surfer Babe and uh, Johnny's Got a Wave. It was ridiculousness. And we'd play these metal clubs because that was the only like 
places that would let us play. And they loved us because we would just go crazy, running around, jumping on the bar, like just making a spectacle. Um, dressed up, like just dressed up like, you know, surf rats. Yeah. Um, that was a lot of fun. But at the same time, I still never really, it wasn't part of the writing bug because I wasn't writing yet. This was yeah. I just the kind of like being a band fun. I dropped out of school a little bit in 10th grade because I we got a gig at a Sheraton in Vero Beach hmm. playing by the pool. So of course, I thought we had made it. That yep. was it. It was rock star time. And uh, we got fired after like two weeks on the job. And uh, just for, again, for shenanigans. You got fired for stealing for stealing beer from the from the. Hotel, we were stealing beer from yeah. the thing, and I also was sleeping with the <laughs> the owners were friends of our keyboard player, and that's how we got the gig. The friends of their parents, and I was sleeping with their daughter, which caused a a big stir, and uh, we were asked politely to leave. I remember the woman actually saying, "You are not the stars. One day maybe you will be the stars, but right now you are not the stars." And that's how she fired us. You know, basically, you're mainly a singer, right? And mm -hmm. and and tell me a little bit about how you, because you were not writing songs when you were in tenth or eleventh grade. And I know you mm -hmm. you would eventually drop out of high school, um, and you know, play with different bands, a lot of cover bands. Tell me how you started to write your own songs. Tell me when that started and how. Well, there was a, a period, you know, between with playing music with the high school guys and just kind of being, you know, lots of different jobs. And I think that was around that time is when I got my, my, I dropped out of high school and got my GED because I was going to join the army. And the only way I could join the army was if I had a GED. Your dad was and in the so army. My right? dad was in you, the army. You were actually born at, at Landstuhl in Germany. And born in Landstuhl and in an yeah. air force base. And to be fair, my dad, his one piece of advice he ever gave me was whatever you do, don't join the army. Uh, but you know, again, there was, and, and I think this, this kind of falls into it a little too, guy, you know, the, when you're a kid at a lot of high schools, the army band comes and plays yeah. and not the band that you're, you know, not the marching band, but the, there's a band, the band yeah. and they come and they play, they were playing like Terrence Trent Darby and they were, you know, and they, and the guy was just like, Hey, and you come in the army, you could do this. And I was like, you know, they had the fatigue sleeves rolled up and they're, you know, Hey, we're just like you, man, we're playing your songs. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh yeah. And then but if you take that between the propaganda telling me that, you know, I don't see my future, I don't see a lot of things lining up. I let college go by. I let, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, employment go by, but they could give me a chance. They could set me up, you know, they could move me forward. So I went in and I, and I took the ASFAB tester, you know, that, that you have to take yep. and got like a 99 on it, which says a lot about how easy that test is. And they were, and then I went and took my, my GED and I got like a 98 on the GED. And then they were like, and we're going to set you up with officer training at the beginning yep. because, you know, we, you look like your, your test skills, scores are great. And somewhere in that time, I had, I was writing, uh, I had written 3 a.m. I think I was like 19. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to get that timeline together right yeah. there because it, there was a very important moment where I did not take the army route thank God. And I went back into music. And then around that time, I started really writing and writing songs that at the time, I'm glad weren't on the first Matchbox record, but they were so much better than anything I had been writing before. They were, they were songs that they were meant to have some sort of a content and some sort of a link to who I was as a person, as opposed to a bunch of love songs just to try and pick up girls. You were in... Um a band that you formed with some friends. You were 21. It was called Tabitha's Secret. Um, right. And, and two of those bandmates would go on to, 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 to join you in Matchbox 20. But you were at that point writing songs, 19, 20, 21. You were writing music. Uh, you were writing mm -hmm. your own songs, uh, including 3 a.m., which would, wouldn't, wouldn't be released for a few more years. But tell me about, about writing that. I mean, um, how... First of all, I, 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 from what I understand, it's about your mom or inspired by, by, mm -hmm. by taking care of your mom, who was at that point quite sick. She was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma, I, I think, when you were 12. And yeah. you had spent a lot of time kind of looking after her. Um, so tell me about that. Tell me about writing that song. Well, I think, you know, like looking back, and I, 
even when I go, I guess sometimes I, that that part of the, of it, which was a huge part of it, but it kind of gets gets looked over. You know, going back, the uh, being with my mom and taking care of her when I was really young and her being that sick. And I think when she beat it, I think that was another part of her n- new liberation, right? Yeah. And where she her her kind of second childhood. Because she was um, she was given six months to live, and they gave her six months to live. Yeah. I mean, she went through the chemo. She lost a lot of her hair. She, but you know, in her her way, she was she was the one who was like, well, if I'm going to lose my hair, I'm going to go out and buy like purple Dolly Parton wigs, and that's what I'm going to wear everywhere. You know, she uh, she was she wasn't going to let it beat her, and she beat it twice. Uh, when she passed away, finally, it wasn't it had had nothing to do with with cancer. Um, but that song was about. I think maybe having to grow up a little earlier, having to like when you when you're young and you've got that kind of sickness in your home. I guess no matter what age, it's your little. It's like the part of part of your life is a little secret that other people don't know about. You know, yeah. it's not it's not a part of that you show them, and everybody else has kind of a, this normal thing going on, this rhythm that you and especially at that age, all these kids are doing twelve and thirteen year old kid things, and your life is nothing like that, and. To yeah. be fair, it, my life was never like that before, but it was just starting to seem like it was never going to get anything more like that. Hmm. Um, and I think when she got better, maybe that's part of why I split too. Did you, Rob, when you were at that time, you know, starting to write your own lyrics, I imagine you were dreaming of making it, but did you think that that was even a prospect? I mean, you were in Orlando, Florida, you're a high school dropout, you'd taken the GD, but like, you were not going to college. I mean, were you thinking, I am going to be a rock star. I'm going to make it. Or like, what was going on in your head at that time? I think when I was, when you're, when I was in like, you know, high school before, you know, late, you know, 17, 18, I think success to me was, you know, like a scene in a movie where you come back and you play at the high school talent show and everybody's like, oh, he's so good, you know? Like I never really applied it to real life because I didn't have a plan for adult Rob. So I never really kind of thought about what adult Rob was going to be doing. Yeah. Um, I think when Tab of the Secret started, we were part of a music scene that was there. In Orlando. Uh, right. We were seeing bands before us having labels come to check them out. So we started to know that that was a possibility, as a, you know, as a thing. We you know we were playing these clubs, we were getting and, paid. And who were and who was I mean Brian and Paul Brian Yale Paul Doucette, Who who were those guys? Were they high school friends or were they just guys you met? No. So, uh, there were two other guitar players, guys named John and Jay, and they knew Brian, and I had these songs, and so they're they're let's let's start a band, and we had a drummer named Chris Smith at the time. And this was a very pivotal time for a lot of reasons. But one of those reasons is these guys one day just kind of came in. I didn't understand anything about the music business, but they came in with a bunch of copyright papers with all of our names on them of my songs and said, here, sign this. They told me that's what you're supposed to do. You know, they were, they were a little more savvy than me. They would, you know, they read Donald Passman's everything you need to know about the music business book. That to me, you know, seemed like they had cred. And so they brought up a copyright paper and we would, we would all sign it. And we played and we became, you know, I think like one of the big local bands, you know, like we were always on the top bill of any local thing. If a national act were to come through town and they didn't have an opening act, they would call us, you know, like we'd open up for Hootie and the Blowfish and feel like rock stars for the night. Yeah. Um, it, it, it went south. We, you know, we, we all had different ideas of what we wanted to be. We were fighting all the time. And, and so you I were left the, front, the band. You were the front man. You were the lead singer. Yeah. I was. So I leave the band. Now, this is a, a really quick, a lot of quick things happen in one motion here. Uh, just before I had quit the band, a guy named Matt Serletic had come to see, or actually, actually his brother, Dean Serletic, came to see the band. Matt Serletic had just had a lot of success with a band called Collective Soul. Mm. On He's a produ- he was a producer for Atlantic. He was a producer yeah. for yeah. Atlantic Records. And... Uh, was having some success, was moving now on to the second successful Collective Soul record. And he was going through, I think, a K100 or K-Rock station, trying to find other bands maybe that he wanted to work with. And his mm. brother is like, you got to come check this band out. Matt came and checked us out. He's like, you know, I don't think the band's really good. I think these songs are really good. Hmm. So like a month or so later, the band breaks up. Matt comes and he says, listen, I think 
we could do something here, you know? I, you know, if, if you want to, I think we could make something happen here. So we, uh, he finds us, Kyle Cook and Adam Gaynor, the two guitar players from Matchbox 20. Mm -hmm. We don't have a name yet. We, we rent out one of those storage spaces. We go to it every day for like eight hours a day. And we start, you know, shedding like four or five songs to play for the label. Mm -hmm. So while this starts happening, the other two guitar players from Tab of the Secret come back with lawyers and try to sue us for this record deal that, that we're trying to get. The record deal comes in and it's for me, for me to sign to Atlantic Records. I say that I don't want the record deal to be alone. I want it to be with me and Paul and Brian. They agree. We all sign the record deal. We're in the middle of this lawsuit hmm. and the lawsuit all hinges around the fact that we wrote these songs together, right? Yeah. So I, I, I go through this. It feels like a long story, guy, but the reason I'm going through it is because they usually say that your your first album that you make is you have your whole life to write that record. Yeah. You know, and that's that's why the second record is really the clutch time. Yeah. But I was so fed up with this whole situation that was going on that I said, fine. Sat down over like a six month period and wrote what became the first Matchbox 20 record, left all of the other songs behind except for 3 a.m. Because 3 a.m. was special to me. And no matter who got paid for it, I knew that that song was going to be special and I wanted other people to hear it. Yeah. So I guess out of necessity and spite, I wound up writing my second record and it, and it was, it was a godsend because maybe though that first group of songs was good on a local level, but it never would have flew nationally. Hmm. You know, like I, I yeah. thought about it every day. Like once we were a band that was playing with like Smashing Pumpkins and the Dave Matthews bands and opening for the Stones, I was like, I, this would never be happening if we were playing those songs. Yeah. So it was like, it's just one of those, another situation where something that you think is the most horrible thing in your life is actually turning out to be this blessing that you haven't seen yet. You haven't seen yeah. it play out yet. Um, and then that was, you know, what became Matchbox 20's first record were those songs. So you, you guys for Matchbox 20 in Orlando, you've got, a bunch of songs you're working on um and 3 a.m is part of of this you know this new plan um but tell me a little bit about how you started to think about i mean at that time obviously it's changed over the course of your career but like take me back to when you were you know in your early 20s and you were writing music i mean where were you i mean 3 a.m obviously connected to your mom, some inspired by your mom. Um, how are you, how are you sitting down and writing music? Were you sort of thinking of melodies in your head and writing down lyrics or were you writing down lyrics and then bringing them to the musicians? Like walk me through the process. It, I think it's, it's always been the same for me. It's always been kind of sitting down with lyric, like a, a melody and like some sort of jumbled lyric speak. And I think it's yeah. a, I've found over the years now, it's a language that all songwriters understand. Um, and somewhere in that, it creates a color tone. It, cre it creates hmm. a, a palette that you start to understand. And, and it gives you a sense of the tone and the, and the timber of what this song is going to be about. And then maybe in that jumble word soup, there's one word that kind of pops out and you're like, oh yeah. I mean, sometimes I can get a third way through a song and, and then I, where I'm just kind of like forming an abstract kind of vision. And then I go, oh shit, that's what this is about. I, now I get, I, now I'm, I know what I'm tapping into here. And then that's where craft comes in and you f fill in the lines around it. And then that's when you kind of like, you know, make your statements and try and write lyrics. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's always been inspiration up front and then craft in the back end. Okay, so you record the record, and that first record, uh, Yourself or Someone Like You, comes out in 1996, and it is mm -hmm. not a hit. It is not no. an instant hit by We sold 605 any... records or something, I think. On in the, the first week. week. Yeah. Um, so you were, I mean, you had a bit of a following, and or a lot of a following in Orlando, but it wasn't, that, that the record wasn't really doing anything i mean mm -hmm. there are thousands and thousands of stories like this you know bands that get signed or artists that get signed i mean we only know of the ones who make it because that those are the ones who become famous but the majority of them don't yeah i mean when you're a kid a kid you know when i say kid because now in my 50s in your 20s you're a kid yeah um 
when you're a kid, you think that the label is the thing. Like yeah. everybody talks about getting signed, getting a record deal. Man, when we get a record deal, when we get a record deal, man, let me tell you, when we get a record deal, I'm going to buy everybody a house. And I'm, you know, like it's all yeah. the imagine, you know, the conversations you would imagine people right. having. And you don't realize until you're in it. And it's almost, and that's, I think it's like nobody tells you, and then they shut the door behind you so that the, the next group doesn't get to see it either, that that's just the ticket to get on the ride. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you just got yourself a chance to take it. And now you get to figure out whether it's going to be a long ride, whether, you know, like what this is, what it's going to bring you. But all you literally got was just a ticket into the door, maybe not even onto the ride yet. Like you got a ticket into the park, you know, and you, and you haven't even, you know, until you start selling records, you don't even get to get on a ride yet. You can just yeah. kind of walk around to the concession stands and get free CDs from the label. Like that was all, that all you could do at the time. Also, also guy, our record label Lava was an imprint on Atlantic. And it, it folded. folded the day like our the record, day. like the day, like I woke up, you know, my manager called, I'm expecting him to be like happy release day. And he's like, all right, listen, don't freak out. And I'm like, well, that's not what you want to hear. So, I mean, the, the, the deck is stacked against you. I mean, you've got this record that you guys think is pretty good, but no one's really going to hear it. And yep. what were your options at that point? What did you guys do? As a band. Well, at the time we weren't, we were still weren't aware of our dire straits because we had had a song okay. that was playing on 120 minutes on MTV. Which, you know? which what was the song? 3 a.m. Uh, no, it was a long day. Okay, it was the first single. I mean, that was a great show, influential, important. Yeah. So it was also putting you guys in that sort of alternative rock world, which, which was a good place to be. Yeah, especially at that time, right? Like yeah. you know, we if you if you. If you're if you're old if you're younger now you don't realize that like in ninety you know ninety five ninety six ninety seven that period alt music was almost like hit pop top forty now like it was right. the thing yeah um we we the one thing we did really good is we went out we went we did more at radio than almost any other new band we would show up before we had a record out we'd show up at radio stations. And whoever wasn't working, we'd bring in pizza and soda and we'd bring them into a conference room and whoever was, wasn't working and willing to, we'd play three or four songs for everybody there. And we did wow. that around the country, like nonstop to any station that would let us in, just walking in cold. Who was behind that? Was that, was that Matt that was behind that, that strategy? Cause that's, I mean, it's like a business strategy. It's very yeah, smart. Yeah, no, this is, I'm, you know, I'm sure this is Atlantic Records. Uh, Andrea Gannis, who's still there, mm. actually, one of the few people that's yeah. still there. She runs radio at, at Atlantic Records. Uh, she was a big champion, you know, for this. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and kind of a savvy street team, you know, like, yeah, it was pre-internet, right? And so there's no social media. So it was, there was a lot of like kind of guerrilla warfare in radio. Like, how do you, how do you make this? You know, how do, how do you get your name right up in front? And to be fair, it didn't really help us a lot on that first single because, you know, a dud is a dud. But uh, we're out on the road playing to nobody pretty much every night. And we pull into Birmingham, Alabama to play the Five Points Music Hall. And there's a line around the block. Wow. It's just packed. And it turns out that a guy named Dave Rossi, who was the program director at the station in Birmingham, on his own, because again, this was a time when you could do this. You could be a program director, take a song that you liked and play it on your station without any playlist, without any computer telling, you yep. know what I mean? No algorithm to contend with. Yep. He played it, played it a lot. It became the number one song in Birmingham, like very quickly. This is Push. This was Push. Yeah. And uh, Atlantic was like, just had their finger on the, you know, the, the drop button was like, well, let's, Let's give this one more round. Let's, they let's were put about it back to, in. They were about the, to drop you guys? Yeah, I mean, because everybody else had gotten dropped around us. Everybody except for, I think, us, Sugar Ray, Kid Rock, and Edwin McCain. I think we're the only four mm. people out of the entire label. There's like bands called Civ, and uh, there's a bunch of other bands that were just, you know, I don't know, maybe they could have done great, but they, they got dropped when everything folded. Yeah. And so we were the second group, you know, on the chopping block. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, everything from that point on was almost like movie level climb strange. You know, like every day was just a move forward and a move forward and a because move forward. Because of Birmingham, Alabama, that song yeah. push. And so then what, then the label released that song as a single nationally? 
Right. They put it out nationally. We did the same thing. We got in the van and the trailer, went back out, but only this time we had a single that we were supporting. All of those stations remembered, oh my God, you were the you were that group of kids that came in and played at our lobby, you yeah. know? And uh and I think to this day, we try to maintain that kind of goodwill with radio because at the end of the day, we're like, we are two things. Even in in social media age, we're a radio band and a live band. Like yeah. those are the two places where where we really feel like we've we've got our roots in. So it was like seven or eight months after the album was actually released when it started to catch fire. And 3 a.m. then gets released as a single and that goes multi-platinum, becomes a yeah. massive hit. You know, it's interesting hearing that song. I, uh, I uh, Obviously, before this conversation, I was listening to a lot of your music and... Um, you know, I know you grew up in the South and you you were immersed in that world. I mean, you had to have listened to, you know, country music growing up. I mean, it was around that you. That was all there was. And there's a part, I mean, there is an element of that song that sounds like a country song. Yeah, I mean, I was, I don't know how many years old when I, when I kind of realized that there was other things. Like when I was a kid, you knew about Willie and Waylon and Merle Haggard and Conway Twitty and Loretta yeah. Lynn Tanya Tucker, like that was everywhere. And then the things that crept through were like Kiss, Michael Jackson, Cool in the Gang. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a few of these things like at the skating rink, right? That you would listen to at the skating rink. Um, and then, I, so I was fully informed by that. So that there was this kind of storyteller mentality in writing that I, that I see. You know, these were like hard men that would go out and they would fuck and fight and drink and then yeah. they'd write these beautiful songs about it, you know? Uh, and then, you know, like the second English wave, I guess you would call it, came through. You know, you got your Depeche Modes and your Bauhaus and Joy Division yep. and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, and like, I remember like Bizarre Love Triangle just blowing my mind the first time I hear yeah. it. Like, So then I'm informed by these two things, this kind of, this pop country, you know, sensibility. Yeah. Um, and then I remember like when I wrote 3 a.m., I wanted it to be Paul Simon. Hmm. Like I, I oh, remember wow. thinking that like she said it's cold outside and she hands me my raincoat. That sounded to me like a Paul Simon line. Yeah. You know, and I it's probably like if you diagram it out, he said every one of those words in a you know, in, in a song somewhere. Well she so, <laughs> so said four in the morning. Tapped yeah. out. Yeah. And also uh what is it? Hand me my cigarettes. I think there's one in my raincoat. Yeah. Right. Uh so um so yeah, I think I wanted to be Paul Simon at that time. The thing about it, my entire career is like, I, I, every time I want to be Jeff Tweedy, I'm Rob Thomas. And every time I want to be Paul Simon, I'm Rob Thomas. And whenever I want to be Elton John, I'm, I'm Rob Thomas. And like, it, you know, it took me a while to kind of start to realize to lean into who I was, you know, or at least maybe just not be disappointed with the outcome. Well, well before, before, before we get, get there, I mean, you're still at this point on, on this rapid now rat what became a rapid climb after you know sort of a grueling six or seven month period of, of just obscurity you guys are essentially touring I think nonstop for like two years yeah you start that tour playing to like 10 people sometimes right you end that tour opening up for bands at, at like stadiums and like playing massive venues just tell me who like who are you at the beginning of that tour and who are you when that ends? Like, because you've gone through a, in just a massive transformation just, just because of the success of the, of the band. But I mean, what did that do to you? Well, I know that uh, going into it. So like, it's funny, like you, you talk about obscurity, like we were obviously more obscure before we had a record deal. We were, you know, like the level that comes right before being obscure, yeah. but you feel more obscure once you get the record deal and you realize that nobody knows who you are. Cause then you're out there, you know, trying to push it, like really push it. You're doing what you did locally only now you're doing it on a much bigger scale yeah. and you're still doing it in the same van and trailer. Um, but I know that at the beginning of the process, when I signed occupation, after I had a record deal, I signed musician. And then at the end of that process, like three years later, when, it, when the whole record was done and the story of that record was closing off, I would sign Occupation International Rock Star. You know, like that was, that was, the, that was the difference. Um, I mean, we had, we, we had learned, we, we spent enough time at each plateau. We had learned how to be a great bar band. 
Mm. Then we had learned how to be a really great small theater band. Then we learned how to be, you know, a great large theater band. And then we were ready to become an arena band. And by yeah. the time we were done with that, we were a fucking great arena band. Um, all that happened because of this kind of slow overnight success that we were having. It was, you know, it was, once it started, it, it climbed steadily, but it's still, we were out on that record for three years playing those same songs and bringing, and, and for us still bringing new life into them because they just kept getting better and better and better and better. We were ready by the end of it, you know, to start playing more songs. Yeah. Uh, and that's where, you know, things got funky too, because when we, when, when the record was over, Atlantic wanted us to go in immediately, you know, and kind of get on the success of this record, start right away. Let's, let's do it back to back to back to back. We had seen, uh, one of the biggest bands of our time right before that was a uh, band, Hootie, the band Hootie and the Blowfish. Right. And they had, they were like, our names kept being said a lot because we were like the two bands that were kind of just good, good guys that played good music. And we had sold a buttload of records. Right. And Hootie came out immediately after that first record, so much so that when they put out their first single from their second record, they still had, they were competing with songs from their first record on the, you know, mm -hmm. on the same charts. Yeah. That to us seemed like a mistake. And we said, thanks, but no thanks. And we just went away for like six months and just kind of like when I got on a bus for the first time, three years later, when I got off that bus in New York City, I was a different person. Yeah. And I'd never been that person off the road. I've never taken that person into real life and like just live in a life and see what that feels like. Um, yeah. And so we went, I moved to New York. I, I had met my wife while I was on the road. She was from New York. We moved to Soho. Um, during that time, that's when I met Etal Sure and Smooth came along because I took that break in between records. Yeah, I mean, you guys you guys had a gap of four years from your first record to your second. You toured, you met your wife and married her in 1998. You're still married t today, which yeah. is also an unusual rock and roll story. Um, puts you in a, a category of very few people. <laughs> to have had a, a marriage that, that last has lasted so long. Um, and you're in New York, and you get approached to work on a song for this is Carlos Santana's like comeback record, right? This is right. the record that he's going to kind of come back and and collaborate with a bunch of artists, and and you're I guess contacted by by somebody I don't know if it was a songwriter, Tall Shore, or some someone mm -hmm. else to work. Well, with actually, them. I got it through Evan Lamberg, who was like one of my best friends at, at the time and still, and he was also my publisher at, at EMI. Mm -hmm. And Evan, so Evan was the guy who who the relationship was was solid. I. Had, I was broke when I met Evan. I had another publishing house offer me $100,000 more than, than Evan's company could offer me. And, the, and I was like, listen, they're like, what can we do? And I was like, well, if you can hire Evan Lamberg, then you know, otherwise I'm, I'm going to go with EMI. And Evan took care of me and he had a plan. And that plan was, we're going to get this matchbox off the ground. I want to get you solo off the ground and I want to have you writing for other people. These are the, like a three point project that he had. So he had this plan and there, and he, he knew that Santana was working on a record and that there yeah. was a song that was being worked on. And what his suggestion was, oh, send it to Rob to see if he could, he could write the song or, or, or improve it or something. Yeah. Etal had written a track and a part of a melody. The lyric was a, a song about like, there's a party on the, the fourth floor in 427 or something and let's all go yeah. to the party. Right. And Carlos is like, he feels the vibe, he likes the vibe, but Carlos doesn't sing about songs about going to the party in 427. Like, And that's there not was his. a melody. There was a... There was a, a, a piece of the melody. Yeah. You know, I think it was... Um, da, da, ba, da, 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 mm -hmm. da, that part was there, the yeah. melody. So he sent it to me, the track with nothing on it, and I wrote the first verse and chorus. Then I went to East Hall. We finished the rest of the song together. Um, and at the time, like I was just thinking, I mean, this is Carlos. I also wasn't thinking that this was going to go anywhere. I didn't think of it a comeback record. I just thought that Carlos was going to make a record yeah. and I was going to get to work with Carlos. And that sounds great, you know, and my first chance writing. And you were not writing this for your voice. No, you were writing I was excited. It for, who was going to sing it in your mind? I wanted George Michael to sing it. 
Oh, wow. And so your, in your mind, it wasn't a song you were writing for yourself, but you were yeah. capturing a kind of a vibe. Like, obviously, that song, obviously, so many millions of people know the song, but it's like you think of like, I mean, you mentioned Spanish Harlem. You think of a hot day. You think of, you know, all this mashup of like Cuban and Caribbean and Latin jazz, like just kind of, you know, spontaneously just on the streets in, you know, in a neighborhood and in in a beautiful woman, like how did you kind of come up with that story? Well, I mean, I, I had been just living in summer in New York. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it was new to me, you know, that feeling of, of like, and you got to imagine it's downtown Soho before Starbucks came. You right. know what I mean? Like it, it still felt like, like Soho and you just got like, cruising through the streets every day. And that energy is just palpable. And I've got yeah. this hot, but equal wife with me, you know, my, my new family is, 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 your, all wife Latin. is your wife is Puerto Rican. Yeah. My wife yeah, yeah. is, is uh, Puerto Rican and Spanish. It all just kind of like made sense to me. And, and then on top of it, it I was writing about my wife and I was writing about Carlos, you know, you're yeah. so smooth. I mean, it's interesting because you were, here's, you, here's this white kid from South Carolina and Orlando who grew up in a totally different like environment, writing a song that was about, you know, about, uh, sort of Latin culture, but you must have been immersed in that because of your wife and her family. Yeah, I mean, you know, that and also when we travel through Spain, you know, we grab a bunch of free CDs from the Spanish label and we were listening to a lot of, you know, a lot of that. We, li- we were doing the same thing with French music and doing the same thing yeah. with, you know, yeah. like we were trying to get to get to places and kind of soak in the musical culture from all these places. Um, I had, I just had my blank page by the time I was in that phase of my life, had a lot more possibilities in it than my blank page when I was starting off as a kid writing, you know, and I was learning more. So there's a lot less uh, conjecture, you know, there's a lot less trying to pretend like you, you know, I'm actually starting to have things that I care about enough to write about, you know, like when you're writing about love and loss early on, it's a lot of speculation. But as you start to get older, you know, I, I I was in love for the first time. Like this was, this was going to the woman I was going to marry. So you, you write this song and, and one of the famous, you know, lines of that song, give me your heart, make it real or else forget about it. Right. I think everyone can hear that, that, that lyric. You record a demo just to send to Carlos Santana, just Mm -hmm. you sing it, but it's just here it is. And you had had hits at this point. You'd had hits with Matchbox 20. So you knew kind of what a hit sounded like. Did you think that this song was, was a hit? I thought that it it sounded like it had possibly, my wife thought that it was going to be a really, really big hit. I, I'm not going to lie. I think I just, I, I wasn't aware at the time of, of how hard Clive Davis and, and his label were, were, were really pushing this and what a priority it was at that label. My next phase of thought, once I realized I, that Carlos, so Carlos had no idea who I was. In fact, I think he said when he heard the demo after a million times trying to figure out who was going to do it, he's like, well, does this guy sing? And they're like, yeah, yeah. He's a singer in a band. You know, they, they just had a successful record. And he's like, well, I believe him. Let's just have him do it. And once I found out I was doing it, I, I had heard some of the other songs on the record, right? And you're talking Eric Clapton, Dave Matthews, Lauren Hill, Wyclef yeah. Sean. So I thought, well, I'm going to be on the record, but no one's going to hear this song. You right. know, like this is like the bastard pop song on this <clears throat> beautiful record. Like I thought that it was definitely going to be Maria Maria. Or Dave yeah. Matthews' Love of My Life. Like one yeah. of those, I thought, especially because you're talking about, even Paul had to walk me down. Like, like the first time someone wrote about it, I called Paul from Matchbox and I was just like, they didn't even mention me in this in this article about this record. And Paul's like, well, dude, like everybody there is really famous. Like, what do you expect? You know, like, you know, you just, and I'm like, yeah, you're right, all right. And so I didn't even know that it was going to be the single yeah. until I was walking out in, in Soho, right, like right outside of my neighborhood, and this, a convertible full of hot girls just stops at a red light and, and the radio's blaring and smooth is just playing out of their car. Wow. And I was just like, oh shit, it's, this is awesome. You know? Um, and then that was the second time in my life that I've ever been a part of something that, that kind of had that escalation. Only nothing I'd ever been a part of was like this on this scale. You know, you mentioned, and 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 I think this was kind of a theme, certainly with Matchbox Twenty, that like, and you've talked about this, that 
there were critics or certain types of fans who who didn't think Matchbox 20 was cool. It didn't matter. Matchbox 20 was huge. You sold millions of records. But there was a, a, a sort of a, a certain type of person who was like, oh, you know, he's not – this is not cool or this isn't mm-hmm. – and, and did that get to you? At the time, sure. I mean, you know, if people wrote about us, they wrote about us that we were a faceless band. You know, we were this band that had sold all these records, but you couldn't pick us out on the street. Um, the only the first time I ever appeared in Rolling Stone, it was just a picture of me at Glastonbury looking really fat. And it said uh, that Rob Thomas has grown as a performer. And then it said, uh, the road to success leads to the deli tray. Um, mm. And I and I was like, that's that's the what you're gonna write about. Uh, we were an easy target, you know what I mean? Like we were we were really successful. We were not very controversial. We're not a band that spoke to any certain disenfranchised youth, you know. Like we we weren't we're not a t-shirt band. We were just a band that if you if somebody mentioned us, and you're like, oh yeah, I like their songs. That's a good band, you know. We yeah. our our songs and our music were much more successful and famous than we were as a band. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sure that's probably, that's still true today, honestly. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you mentioned, um, a, a little while ago, you know, you, you wanted to be Paul Simon, but you, you were Rob Thomas. You, you wanted to be Jeff Tweedy, but you're Rob Thomas. And it's interesting because, um, you would go on to write songs for, and have written songs for tons of other artists. Like I, we had Ryan Tedder on the show a couple months ago and, Obviously, you know, he has a similar career in the sense that he has recorded his own top singles and has written singles for yeah, other people. Yeah. Um, he's amazing. Then, I remember I, him and I were in a bar one night and he said, you know, I, I was talking about you and I think you're probably one of the most ubiquitous ra- writers that I hear on the radio consistently everywhere. And I was like, no, dude, you're the guy that I hear everywhere on the radio. You yeah. know, and he's like, no, no, no. He's like, between me and, you know, he said, between your work and your solo work mostly, and he's like, between me, you know, Ryan's work and his, you know, with other people, because he writes so many hits for other people. Yeah. I wrote a lot of songs for other people, but they weren't necessarily hits, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't have a giant group of hits that I wrote for Willie Nelson or for, you know, Mary J. Blige or Seal, but I just, I, it was just nice to be able to, to work with people like that. For sure. Do you, I mean, do you... I mean, when you when you talk about thinking of other songwriters that you admire, like Paul Simon or Jeff Tweedy or others, but that when did it get to a point where you were, where you you were able to say, "I don't have to be that person. I am me. Like I, this is who I am. This is the way I work." Did it take you a while to get comfortable in your own skin? I, I mean, I don't. I think there's a part of me that always retains the the part that doesn't. You know, like I, I feel like there's so much art is exists in that space between who you are and who you want to be. And so hmm. I think feeling that you figured it out might, might, you know, be the curse. Hmm. Um, but I do feel like I, I, I started to feel comfortable in knowing that I have a certain style, you yeah. know, and if, and if this sounds like Rob Thomas, that's okay. Um, and because I find that when I tried other things, they never land in quite the same way. They just, they, they, and, and what I had was that whatever I've written that's done well, especially it was genuine. I, I was yeah. giving someone something real that I, that I was thinking about. It wasn't manufactured. It didn't come from some other place. And I was giving the best song that I could at the time. And mm. so if nothing else, I had authenticity. And so I realized I didn't want to give that up to try to like be cooler and that, yeah. and that was a big thing for a while. Like even when we were on Spin for the first time, Spin Magazine, Paul had written on a giant T-shirt. He wrote, "Cool bands don't sell records." <laughs> um, and so I think you know by by record three or end of record two, we leaned into it. Like we would literally we would roll into a town, and like the, the local music magazine would say, uh, Ma- uh, "Matchbox Twenty, bland white American rock." And then we would all buy white t-shirts and write bland white American rock. And that's what we'd wear on stage that night. You know, like we, so we'd, we'd started to find a way to lean into it instead because yeah. at the same time, like we were, we were selling a lot of records. We were making a lot of money. We were selling out all these arenas. Yeah. It, it would, I don't know. It just seemed stupid to complain, you know? And this, yeah. and this is where everybody that we've ever seen be really successful kind of found themselves at some point. When they just say, screw it, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to worry about what other people or critics think about my work. 
Yeah, and you know, now it's an amazing thing. The bands that we were really, really jealous of for their profile, a lot of them aren't around at all. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I'm much happier with the way things panned out. Again, you know, when you're in it sometimes and you feel like this, this is the worst thing ever, you don't realize that it's, you're in the middle of the blessing right then. Um, your, your wife was quoted saying, you know, if, if Rob was, you know, a different person or if, he, if people knew about the way he grew up or something, he would be considered to be, you know, one of the most gifted songwriters out there. Um, but he's, you know, often passed over as this like bland middle class white guy. Um, she, she, she said because people didn't, you know, don't know you. Did you, did you feel that way that y- you were sort of overlooked as a songwriter because maybe you weren't, I don't know, talking about your story or your life or for reasons that you can't really put your finger on? No, I mean, I think that if anything. I, I give people so little about me personally. There's, there's so little sensationalism around me as a, you know, like what I'm selling isn't anything more than the music that I'm making. Yeah. I'm really happy that, it, that, it, that it's done as well as it has. You know, people can't be underrated. You know, like whenever somebody talks about people being underrated, they talk about like a Jeff Tweedy. Jeff yeah. Tweedy isn't underrated. Jeff Tweedy just isn't as successful as someone who appreciates music like that, like that thinks that they should be, Right. But they're not underrated. Every if you talk about great songwriters, they're going to talk about Jeff Tweedy every time. Yeah, you know he's just he's a, he's a you're going to talk about Wilco. You're going to talk about uh, um, Leonard Cohen. You know, like you're going to talk about yeah. these people. They're not underrated. They're just there's a in the same way that like uh, classical classical music is is undercompensated. You know, it's not underrated. It's just undercompensated. Uh, yeah, I think that. I'm in a good place where nobody thought that I was overcompensated. Uh, and I, I managed to make a living playing the music that I write. So I, I can't feel that I was underappreciated or underrated. I think that, yeah. you know, if you like me, you, you come to see me play. And if you don't, you don't. That sounds fair. <laughs> How do you write a song? I mean, and this is such an open-ended question and maybe even abstract, but like, you, I mean, Matchbox 20 has a new record, right? I mean, which is amazing. The band is still, you guys still make music together, you know, 30 years later, which is ama- amazing, right? But when you sit down to write music now, you're you're in your 50s. It's a different, the world is different. You're, the things around you are different. What inspires you is different. How do you get an idea and how do you, how do you start that? just pen to paper process. I mean, I think I kind of keep my head cleaned up and ready for the muse whenever she, you know, makes her way through. I think Mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like the muse has been cheating on you with with a younger (laughs) man. You know, I think that man might be Ed Sheeran, but, but that's, (laughs) but that's just, that's the way it happens sometimes, you know? Uh, I'm always writing. Like writing is a constant process. It's, if I if I'm off the road and if I'm not doing anything, I make I make an effort a few hours a day to come down, turn on the computer, turn on my keyboard, and just start fishing around for something to see if something pops up. Yeah. More often than not, I'm just cooking or something or driving, and a melody kind of pops up, and you make a little voice note, and then you go down and you kind of flesh it out. And I try and just write, 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 and then when it's time for a project, I see what you know which of those kind of work. Um, I write, I'm sure, no exaggeration for every record that anybody's heard. I've probably written three, hmm. you know, and, and a lot of those are like full demos, like eight hours a day of making bass, making drums, making counter melodies, you know, writing the whole thing out. And it just sits on my computer for years and years and years and no one yeah. will ever hear it. But I had to get through that one to get to the, you know. The next one. So you've got to, I have to finish them because there's also like an OCD in my head that if they clutter up and I don't get rid of them, there's no room for other ones, you know? Yeah. Th- this, this new record um, that you guys released, Where the Light Goes Out, uh, where, where the Light Goes, um, how do you, I mean, what, what are the stories that you're telling now at this, this moment in your life? What, what is that record? You know, um, I know there's you know there's a, a single off there called Wild Dogs that came out um, earlier in 2023, um, but what is the, you know, what's the sound you're going for? What's the, 
what's the mood you're you're going for? Is it is it different? Has it changed from ten years ago, twenty years ago? A big difference between like early Matchbox, like first record Matchbox, and now is there is zero trace of manufactured angst. Do you know what I mean? Even if at the time we didn't realize it was manufactured, maybe. Uh, but there's zero trace of performative anger. Yeah. You know, like I'm gonna be the show you ha ha. I don't. You know, like we 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 have started to move farther and farther and farther away from that. It's funny. Somebody said something that was meant to diss us on a on a board the other day, and we, we were laughing because we loved it. They're like, you know. I used to love them on their first record when they were like rock band, but now they're just like Wham with four guys. <laughs> and I was like, dude, Wham was awesome. Are you kidding me? That's great. Um, we, uh, we're not scared to, to be happy. We're not scared to have some joy in our yeah. songs and joy in our music. Um, when we write about getting older, it's not necessarily lamenting our youth. Uh, in the way that, that a song about getting older used to be, it's more about embracing all the, the things that come with getting older, all the things that we've acquired over the years. You know, the fact that we got a chance to be young and not everybody who's young gets a chance to be old. And it's a yeah. gift that, you know, that we have. And every, you know, every time that we do this, it's, it's a gift you know, that we're given to be able to have this time. And so it's the best case scenario to be older. So writing songs about being an older person is about writing songs about being a survivor and being, yeah. you know, being a champion because you're, you're still around. Um, and so we find you know, that, that subject, those subject matter, we grab, they, those are the things we kind of gravitate towards a lot more. Um, you know, I write, if I write a song that isn't a joyful song, you know, it's not like Queen of New York City. I'm not sure if it's necessarily joyful, but in my way it is because it's a song where I use to celebrate my wife and every, it's about everything that she's been going through health wise and all the problems she's yeah. had to go through. But it's really about her strength and her resilience through the eyes of like a Don Quixote character and who, you know, who is a New Yorker going through and battling the, the buildings like they're the giant windmills and, uh, and realizing that I think the more, if you have that much heartbreak and that much of the universe trying to keep you down, the only way that you possibly stay strong and resilient is to be a little bit delusional and a little bit crazy. You know, yeah. I think the only way that you get through a lot of things is by suspension of disbelief and a little bit of naivete and saying, no, I'm, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to make it. I got this. Um, you, you mentioned the, the song about your wife. You've been married, I think, over 25 years. Um, and she's had some, some help challenges um i know and you were you, you, you've talked about it and um how, first of all how is she doing uh it's it's a th it's still a thing it's just a thing you know what i mean it's a yeah. it's a constant thing that you live with every day i i say it's something that she lives with every day um i've just you know i use the, the word resilient a lot but i think it's because i'm amazed at seeing someone who goes through something that can literally take them out of commission for days and then the first day that they get a whiff of like energy, they want to do take on the world with it. You know, they're awesome. just they want to do yeah. everything with that day. So um the uh it's funny, like I I never thought that I'd be in a situation where the question I'm asked the most is, you know, how's Mahdi? Hmm. <laughs> you know? Uh it's it's kind of our it's our little heartbreak over here that we deal with. But yeah, she I think she deals with it better than most. What do you think accounts for the fact that that Matchbox 20 is now, I mean, you're, you're approaching 30 years together as a band, you yeah. know, your first record was released in 96, but you guys really got together in 94, 93, 94. Um, what, what do you, th why do you think the band still makes music today? I mean, so many bands don't make it. They split up their fights, their, you know, disputes. And we had Johnny Marr on the show of, of the Smiths, you know, an amazing band that for four years produced incredible music, but that was it. they, they split up and had a falling out and they're never going to get back together. Yeah. Why, why are you guys still playing together? What's the secret? I don't know. I mean, you know, I went solo when I knew I had to go solo. Um, and the guys let me come back and we kept, you know, and they knew that that was now just a part of my personality and, and my identity and who I was. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think when we did that, it opened up the floor to let Matchbox be more collaborative and a lot more real estate for people to write and not just play my songs. Uh, at the core of everything with Matchbox, we really like each other. 
Like we mm-hmm. really do. There's a genuine love and a fondness that we have for each other. Yeah. And we get together when we do it, we do it for real and we do it for keeps and we enjoy it. We enjoy the process. And maybe, maybe those things are, uh, maybe it's geography. Maybe it's because early on we moved to like LA, New York, Nashville, and Miami. So we have that absence, you know, and that distance and we get together, we're genuinely glad to see each other again. Uh, whenever we're apart, you know, Paul's has, has a successful television and film, uh, scoring Paul, uh, Kyle's been producing and writing and, and playing and doing solo stuff. We come back together. We bring all that back together and we're kind of excited. Like, Oh, look what I learned. Look what I learned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think if we were a band that were like, we have to make a record every, you know, however many years and we have to tour here, we have to do. And we felt like we were being held to that we might implode and then not be a band anymore. But I think because we've always been like a, they were like a butt dial or like a booty call band. We're like, you up, you know, Hey, (laughs) you want to make a record? All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, And you can tour. And I mean, you have a a huge fan base around the world. So, I mean, at any moment you guys can tour and sell out big venues wherever you go. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, even now with a new record, we're not unaware that, you come to see Matchbox Twenty because we've been around for thirty years. There's a huge yeah. part of it is nostalgia. Yeah, you know, in the, but in the same way that I am, if I go see you too, I don't think of sure. them as an old band. I just know that I that I want to hear all the songs that I love. Yeah, um, that's a that's one of the biggest gifts I think. Like when we did this record, we weren't going to make a record. We had, we actually after North decided that we were never going to make a record again. Hmm. We were just going to tour every now and then, every few years, um, maybe a, a new song here and there. Uh, and that was going to be it. Like that was kind of what we thought our career looked like. Cause I was, I was going to keep doing solo. Um, Paul was doing his film scoring. That was just what we felt like we had time for in our life because the things that are super important to you in your twenties are not the same things that are important to you in your fifties. And yeah. when we were young, the only way this band could get off the ground is it had to be everything to everyone. You had to give up everything, all your time, all your friends and loved ones, everything poured into this band for years and years and years. It was like a, you know, getting a plane off the ground. Like you had to put all of that inertia into it. And now at this age, it's very important to us, but it's not everything. Yeah, It it can't be, you know, like now my wife and my son, you know, my family, those things, Paul's family means more to me than the band does. You know what I mean? So like if Paul can't do something because of the family, of course we all understand. Uh, That just comes with getting older. Yeah. Do you, um, I mean, do you imagine that, that you're going to be recording music until the end of your life? I mean, do you, is, is that the plan? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's going to, I think there'll be a lot less, you know, like ass shaking music and a lot more stool sitting music, but yeah, I think, uh, I, you know, I think it's, you can write songs as long as you can breathe, you know, Mm -hmm. they're all in there. Uh, and I, and I, when I was, tw- when you're 20 years old and you look back at your teen self, like some idiot that you, that's not even attached to you. Right. And then in your thirties, you're like, no, now I understand. Like I'm in thirties now, I'm, you know, my twenties, I was a young man. I'm going to, I'm going to put those things away. And then forties, you're like, oh man, but thirties, that was the time, you know, but, but now the wisdom. And, and so I can't imagine that stopping anytime soon. And I think 60 year old me is going to have a lot to say. Mm. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to want to hear it. <laughs> and you know, at that point, may you know, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you just if there's an initiated group of people that want to, you know, I'll, I'll play it for those people. But if I don't get it out, it's going to clutter up my head, guy. So I'm going to still have to get it out there. Do you go through periods where you feel less confident as a writer? Yeah, all the time. You, I don't you think I'm a great doubt. writer. You yeah, I don't think, think I'm a great, great. No, I think I'm a good writer. You know what I mean? I think I'm a really competent writer, and I think I have moments of real inspiration. I think I have like moments where I'll listen back and I'm like, wow, that was a good line or that's a really mm-hmm. good melody or like, um, but I never, I mean, I've never thought of myself as like, look at me. I am the great songwriter. I just, I feel like it's, I'm doing exactly what I should be doing for a living. And I think I, I probably do it better than if you look at the amount of people in the planet, right. That right. But if you just look at you know, like people who are good songwriters and put me in there, I'm just one of them. You know, and then a lot of them, I'm just like, oh, how did you do that? It, like somehow, like I, somebody can still write 
a verse and a chorus and a fucking bridge. And it's so good. It sounds like math to me. Like, I yeah. just don't understand. Like, where did that come from? It's, I know those chords. I know those melodies. I, if I sit down and, and suss it out, I'm like, oh, I know how you got there, but I don't know how I can make myself come to that conclusion on my own. And so I guess one day when I'm not fascinated, you know, at least once a week by some, you know, new songwriter, then maybe then I'll feel like a great songwriter. Does it matter if you, if you, I mean, to me, self-doubt is critical. I think it's su super important for, for any, any, anyone going through a, a, you know, a creative slowdown or whatever. I mean, it's, I think it's part of the process. Um, but how do you, how do you overcome moments where you're like, I suck or I'm not good? If you have the Oh, then, then you, uh, just the right one comes at the right time. And then you feel like the God of creation for at least 24 hours. You feel like, oh my God, I am a, I am a, I am great. I'm amazing. Like, listen to this. Where did this come from? I have no idea. You know, this is inspiring me. I'm going to go write every day now. I'm going to write a song a day now. It's pouring out of me. And then like it wears off like some sort of a drug and you're just like, oh, I'm a hack. I don't, I can't do that again. I don't know where that came from. Uh, I, I mean, I think you have to, you have to bring your own inspiration at some yeah. point. You have to do something that inspires you. And then, because it's not past success, you know, sometimes past success, you don't want that to become some sort of a prison that you're in, yeah. you know? Like there's a great, it's a great feeling when somebody comes and says, oh my God, I used to love your band in high school. Yeah. There's something amazing about that. But then the insecurity in you is always just like, well, what about now? Yeah. Like, yeah. what's going yeah. on now? Yeah. So it, uh, I think past success alone is definitely not enough that's going to you know, pull you out of that hole. You have to write something. And it doesn't have to be a successful something. That's, that's, that's key. Doesn't know, it, you know, it's, nobody even has to hear it, really. But you have to write something that you feel like you, you're amazed at, you know? And that's basically, it's, it, I mean, basically, it's just you got to do the work. Yeah, you got to do the work and it is you've got to be quality control for yourself, you know. There's, there's so many things out there I think that I didn't think were going to land and they landed a lot better than they, they did or things that I thought were going to be really big and they weren't. That's why I'm not an A&R guy. That's why I don't work at a label, you know. I just can I just know that each one of those songs when I wrote it, I felt like I was writing one of the best songs I could at the time. Yeah. Rob Thomas, thanks so much. Guy, thanks. That was a great interview. I appreciate it. Nice conversation. Thanks for watching my chat with Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20. By the way, their new record is now out. It's called Where the Light Goes. And you can learn more about Rob and see clips from his videos and get links to his music at our website, thegreatcreators.com slash Thomas. And if you enjoyed this, please give us a thumbs up. Maybe even consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you right back here next week.